Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Double Patel. I'm the Scientific Account Manager for Nemo Life. I'm actually joined by Martin Toth, who is our Chief Business Officer, and he'll be my co-pilot today. So any questions you write down in the chat, Martin will relate to me, and then hopefully we'll answer them towards the end. So today I'd like to talk about how Nemo Life can help you, uh, you know, automate your C. elegans lifespan, stress, and behavioral studies. So I'd like to start off, I'd like to start off with an introduction. Uh, let me just pull up. Sorry. <laughs> Teething bugs. I'd like to start off with a quick brief introduction. So as everyone in this room knows, C. elegans is really the cornerstone of modern aging research. And that's because in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there have been these seminal papers by people like Michael Klass, Tom Johnson, and obviously Cynthia Kenyon, who, who's now legendary DAF tube paper, really kick-started a lot of a lot of the field. Um, you know, that they laid the foundation for what has been this subsequent explosion in papers. So if we actually look at this figure on the right here, you can actually see that from the 70s, we were publishing a handful of papers that were to do with biology and C biology of aging and C elegance. And that's really rocketed it up over those 50 years to the point where last year we had almost 400 papers published using C elegance as a model for aging research. But what's really surprising about you know, the, that explosion in, in C. elegans research is that the methodology for doing aging studies hasn't really changed in that intervening 50 years. So essentially, there are just two ways of doing assays. There are plate-based assays and liquid-based assays, and they both have different pros and cons. So most of you are going to be very familiar with plate-based assays. And one of the reasons why plate-based assays are so popular within the community is that transferring worms from plate to plate are very simple, very easy. But you have to remember that agar is a gel and it acts like a sponge. And so if you're trying to do a longevity compound screen or do drug delivery into the worm, you know, that material is soaking up a lot of that, that, that drug. And so that actually makes delivery of that compound really inefficient into the worm. But as a pro, because the worms are on the surface of that agar, you don't have to worry about oxygen tension. So the, you know, the oxygen is not an issue for those worms because they're exposed to atmospheric oxygen. Now, liquid assays solve a different set of problems. So liquid assays are typically conducted in micro well plates and transferring worms out of one well into another can actually be very, very challenging. I actually did liquid lifespans when I was doing my PhD and I really hope to never do them again. Um, but the reason that they remain, uh, uh, you know, sort of part of our toolkit in the worm community is that because that you know liquid environment has your drug or compounds dissolved in it it's very easy for the worm to get them into its intestinal system because it's actively pumping obviously media into its intestine and so you can get more efficient drug delivery via a liquid based assay than you can on a plate based assay but now if you're not very careful you know and you're not agitating that liquid you actually can end up getting hypoxic conditions, which can be bad for your worm. Now, as I said, both of these you know, methods have their pros and cons, but one thing that I think we'll all agree on that you know, limits us is that manual aging assays are very labor intensive. And I'd like to illustrate that with a story from my own personal life back from when I was a postdoc. So here is me as a postdoc uh, in 2011 with my partner in crime, Dr. Eugenie Enchip. And we're standing in front of a pallet of Petri dishes from Griner. Now, that was the, you know, the, the, the number of plates that we were going to be using to kick off the series of experiments that eventually led to the publication that you're seeing on the right. And this is figure 1A from that paper. In this figure, we looked at wild-type worms, and we looked at the mean lifespan across 19 different food conditions. And we assayed, in total, about almost 5,000 surviving worms. But the crazy thing about this figure is that it took over 2,000 plates over the course of the summer to generate that data. And it took Eugenie and I both working eight hours a day to transfer and score those worms. And we think that's a really large manual intensive uh, effort for two postdocs to be working on when you're trying to publish. And so that's a really big bottleneck. And there have been attempts to try and improve that bottleneck by many you know, different players in our community. And the way that they've tried to solve this issue is by trying to improve throughput by bringing in some form of automated imaging. So now I know that there are lots and lots of different automated imaging platforms. 
I'm just going to point out four that I'm very familiar with, starting with the original sort of, you know, granddaddy of, uh, uh, of automated imaging, which is the uh, lifespan machine. More recently, we've seen Worm Motel uh, and Wormbot, and then a platform that I was involved in, Health, which was, you know, publicized last year. Now, these are great examples of using automation to try and improve the throughput of aging studies. But they all, you know, they all have slightly different methodologies in how they work, but they all have one thing in common. And that is that these are all do-it-yourself solutions. You know, you have to build these systems in your group if you want to use them. And so we think that provided an opportunity for Nemo Life. So Nemo Life is actually dedicated to bringing you out-of-the-box solutions for your CL Logan's research. So who, who are we? We're actually a biotech company based in Lubbock, Texas, and we consist of a team of engineers and biologists with extensive history in C. Elegans research. So what do we actually do? So we are bringing our ready to use microfluidic technology to academic labs to help accelerate their experimental throughput by basically reducing the manual labor. And that has two advantages. It essentially increases the time that you can then spend on data analysis, which will be your next bottleneck to solve. But also it increases the amount of time that you can spend creatively thinking. And that hopes, hopefully will help you make smart decisions about which experiments you need to do next in order to get that paper. So in today's session, I'd like to talk about four things. First off, we're going to talk about Nemo Life's um, solutions for automating life cycle six. Then we're gonna be talking about our product for automating behavioral and stress assays. After that, I'd like to talk about our solution for, for solving the bottleneck that solving the first two problems generates, which is data analysis. So we're gonna to present to you how we think we can solve that problem. And then I'm gonna finish off talking about our screening services. So let's kick off with automating lifespan assays. Now, our journey into automating lifespan assays begins with the Infinity Chip. This is our patented microfluidic device for housing worms across their entire lifespan. And we typically recommend that you can put 60 to 70 animals per chip. Now, this chip design is relatively simple in the sense that it has just a single port for loading your adults into it. And then it has a fluid inlet and outlet system, and those ports allow you to wash animals and get rid of progeny. If you can see this diagram, these white strips are actually barriers, perforated barriers that allow eggs and young larvae to be cleared from the chip. So one of the advantages of the Infinity Chip is that if you want to, you don't need to use progeny blocking drugs. You can actually conduct your assays without them because you're able to wash away the larvae generated every single day by the adult. Now, one of the most important factors of the Infinity Chip, that arena contains a forest of 40,000 micro pillars. And those pillars actually promote a crawling behavior rather than swimming. And that's important for us because as you can see on this figure on the left, we've shown that if you have animals in a chip that has no pillars compared to animals in the pillared chip, you can see that there's a significant difference in lifespan. And that's, because crawling is actually known to be less stressful for the animals on chip than swimming. And so, you know, that, that forest of micropillars promotes that crawling behavior and, and gives you that, you know, less stressful environment. But also because you're seeing crawling behavior, you're also able to see behaviors that are akin to behavior seen on plate and you're not looking at swimming based behaviors. Now, obviously what matters to most of you who might be using our chip is that infinity chip lifespans are very comparable to agar plates, as you can see on this panel on the left. Now, one of the reasons that we think the infinity chip uh, arena is, is, a, is a good model for lifespans or comparable to lifespans on plate is not only that the lifespans are similar, but if you actually look at the total progeny production by an individual animal, as seen on the right here, you can see that there isn't a significant difference between the amount of progeny produced by a single animal on an agar plate and those on infinity chip. And that tells us that this forest of micro pillars is actually really, you know, doing a good job of, of emulating plate-based conditions. In liquid, animals tend to end up retaining their eggs. And so you see a, a, a large percentage of matricide. And you don't see that on the infinity chip. 
And so we think this is you know, much better than, than platforms that essentially have the worm swimming. Now, obviously, you know, not everything that you do will want you to keep the worms in the Infinity chip. And we have robust protocols for getting them out. Now, obviously, the chip is designed already to remove progeny and let you just collect them at the flow through end. And that can be very useful if you're doing transgenerational experiments. So, you know, if you're interested in doing transgenerational lifespans and you need to collect the progeny, very easy to do with the infinity chip. You're just collecting the flow through every day, and those animals will be the animals laid that day. But obviously, there are going to be situations where you'll want to recover the adults. Uh, for example, you may be interested in performing transcriptomics or metabolomics on these animals at specific ages. And we have robust protocols that allow you to safely remove these animals from the chip intact and alive. The other thing I'd like to point out about the Infinity chip is that it's completely compatible with thrustless microscopy. So what you're seeing here is a 10x image of an adult worm on in the Infinity chip. And this animal has been fed with two fluorescently labeled bacteria from the C. elegans microbiome project. One of these bacteria is expressing GFP and the other is expressing M. cherry. And what you see is that these different species have different gut colonization preferences. So as you can see, the gut colonization of the GFP strain is primarily in the anterior gut, whereas the colonization of the M. cherry expressing bacterial strain is primarily, primarily in the posterior gut. So we think that's, you know, it's a good that you can obviously do fluorescence imaging with the infinity chips. Now I'd like to tell you something about the infinity chips that happened earlier this year. So our infinity chips have actually made it into the great beyond. So earlier this year, on the 24th of March, Vice President Kamala Harris spoke with NASA astronauts, Dr. Shannon Walker and Dr. Kate Rubens about research they were conducting in space. And I'd like to play you a quick snippet of that conversation. You all are such incredible role models. Tell us a little bit about what work you are doing up there. What are you researching? We've got over 100,000 nematodes, little tiny worms. We're going to be studying those worms to look at how muscle strength changes when you're in space. So, you know, it's nice to see the vice president and obviously NASA astronauts discussing worms in space. I'm sure most of you saw those clips. They were widely shared around the, uh, the community. And what's exciting for us as a company is that the version of the chip that they're actually using is based off a design from our CTO. And so it was really, really amazing for us to be involved in that project. Now, obviously the Infinity chip is the basis for what I'm gonna talk about next, which is really our, our hardware for doing lifespans. And so now I'd like to introduce you to the Infinity screening system. This is our benchtop platform for doing programmable fluid exchange using the Infinity chip. And it is you know, capable of doing automated washing and refeeding of the animals on chip. Now, the way that the system is currently configured is that you can, can, you know, you can uh, wash and feed two chips simultaneously uh, at one time point. So how do we do imaging on the Infinity screening system? Well, the way we currently do imaging is that we actually use you know, a convenient um, third party product. We actually use the iPod Touch. The reason we use the iPod Touch is that the camera has good resolution, but it has a very nice wide field of view. And that wide field of view is great when you're trying to image the arena, because you can obviously capture the whole thing and you can see all of your animals very easily. The other advantage of the camera on the iPod Touch is that it has the ability to record at multiple frame rates. And actually you can push that all the way to 120 frames per second. And so while we don't typically use that for our lifespan studies, we imagine that those of you who might be interested in, in imaging worms for behaviors may need to actually image them at relatively fast, fast frame rates. Now, the other reason that we like using the iPod Touch is that it's, an, it's a Wi-Fi enabled device. And so you can actually directly upload those videos as you're recording them to a cloud storage account, which makes subsequent analysis easier. So I'd like to take you through the workflow of using the Infinity Screen system. So in this diagram, what you're seeing is on the left, we synchronize our animals on plate, just like you would with you know, most other animals, uh, so most other aging assays. And you're gonna load L4 animals into your infinity chip. 
once you are, once you have the animals in the infinity chip, you're going to use the infinity screening system to do your imaging, and then you're going to put those chips in containers just to prevent them from dehydrating, and then store them in your incubator. Now, those videos that you take from your initial imaging run, you'll feed into a data analysis pipeline. And then what you do is you just reiterate this process every day, and you'll basically take the chips out of the incubator, wash them to remove progeny, refeed the chips, image again. And then once you've imaged, that data obviously goes into your data analysis pipeline, and the chips then go back in the incubator. And you obviously repeat that until all your worms have died. And obviously, once all that's done, the data analysis pipeline will start spitting out what you want, which is obviously survival curves, comparisons of you know, uh, activity and the amount of progeny produced if you're reporting such metrics. Now, as I said, you know, the infinity screening system is really designed to accelerate the throughput for lifespan assets. So a single user can actually carry out an experiment you know, processing about 100 chips in about four hours. So that's basically imaging, washing, and then refeeding the worms. And now, based on, you know, the population uh, metrics I told you earlier, that's the equivalent of generating survival data for about 6,000 to 7,000 animals if you're using 100 chips. Now, we always recommend that you use two chips per condition just so that you have a technical replicate in an experiment. Um, and so if you do the math, that actually allows you to potentially look at 50 different experimental conditions. Now, bear in mind, at the beginning, when I showed you my own little uh, you know, history in aging assays, that figure that I put up looked at 19 different conditions. And it was taking two of us eight hours a day to transfer all of those worms across those 19 different conditions. So you know, here, you've essentially got two and a half times that throughput for a single user. So we think that's a significant acceleration in the ability to conduct lifespan assays. So moving on, I'd actually like to talk to you about um, a product for trying to automate behavioral and stress assays. Now we know that the worm is a great model for examining the biology of behavior and also looking at organismal stress responses. And actually what's really nice about the worm is often those stress responses feed into behavior. So you get some really nice, interesting things happening when you study the two together. But again, just like aging, these uh, behavioral and stress assays typically rely on you know, manual observation by the scientist to actually look at, see what the worm does in response to a specific cue or stressor. And again, that can actually be an intensive you know, workload and creates its own bottleneck by being very, very slow. But we think the Infinity chip provides a potential solution to that problem by you know, virtue of some of its, 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 um, its assets. So first of all, as we've said, the infinity chip is designed to contain a liquid medium. And so that liquid medium is tunable. You can actually put in whatever you want to study. So you could put in a chemo attractant, you could put in a stressor, put in a chemo repellent. Now, more importantly, because of that micropillared arena, you are looking at crawling behaviors, which means that you can actually see behaviors that are very similar to the types of behavior you see on plate. And again, because you've got that inlet outlook port, you can quickly switch liquid environments. So you can do assays where you can dope in, a, let's say, a, a, stress aging, a, a, a stress agent, and then you can also remove it at a time point that makes sense for your assay. And so overall, that combination of features, we think, you know, makes the Infinity chip very useful for behavioral and stress assets. However, the infinity screening system is really designed for long-term assays. You know, that, that workflow I described earlier is typically you know, doing 90-second imaging of the worms. Um, and also, the infinity screening system is a benchtop unit. So you know, that's not very convenient if you want to just go away and leave the system running to collect a large amount of video. And typically, you know, you'd want to do that in a way where you can put something straight in the incubator. So, that got us thinking that we really needed you know, a product that was much more compact. And so today I'd like to introduce you to the Phoenix, just to show you what the Phoenix looks like. This is the Phoenix. It's uh, just next to an infinity chip here. But to get a real sense of how compact the unit is, I'd like to show you what the Phoenix looks like next to its big brother, the infinity screening system. So as you can see, the Phoenix on the left is clearly much more compact unit than the infinity screening system. And it's designed to 
to really, you know, just be put in an incubator. So as I said, you can put the Phoenix in the incubator for the entire assay. And what's really great about the Phoenix is that it's USB powered. So you can actually just connect the unit, put a power bank into your incubator, and then just have it running for several days. But also, because it's USB powered, the Phoenix is actually portable and field deployable. So we think for those of you who might be interested in doing you know, work in the field, those of you who collect wild isolates, for example, or other types of nematode species, you can essentially collect nematodes from the soil, extract the liquid, load them into an infinity ship, and then actually get video recordings of what these animals look like and what they're doing. And we think that will be very useful. Now, obviously the Phoenix is very compact. And so that does limit its, its, its uh, throughput compared to the infinity screening system. It's only designed to image a single chip at a time. And obviously, because we've had to shrink the form factor down, we aren't able to include all the pumps and the programmable controllers for doing automated uh, liquid exchange. And so liquid exchange on the Phoenix is manual, just you doing syringe-based uh, liquid exchange. Now, you know, the reason that we think the Phoenix is gonna be great for doing behavioral studies is that you can actually collect long-term videos. For example, if you're using a 256 gigabit iPod, you can, sorry, gigabyte iPod, I should say, you can actually collect 100 hours of video footage if you're recording at five frames per second. And so if you're doing a stress assay or a behavior assay that takes you know, multiple hours, this is perfect for that. Now, we actually think that the Phoenix is going to be great for educational outreach. We know a lot of members of the worm research community do actually engage with STEM outreach. And we think that the Phoenix will be the perfect tool for you to take into a classroom and really get that next generation of C. elegans scientists excited about doing experiments with the worm. We think you know, the ability for students to play with the chip, conduct worm loading, washing, and imaging is going to be a great hands-on activity. And the nice thing about the iPods is that they actually allow real-time mirroring of what's happening on chip and what's being recorded onto TVs in the classroom. And so not only are the students who are directly manipulating the chip getting the benefit, but everyone else in the classroom can actually see what's happening in real time. And so that will keep everyone engaged. So we think the Phoenix is gonna be a great tool for educational outreach. Now, obviously I talked about behavioral and stress assays. And so obviously you'd like to see that we can actually do stuff like that. So first of all, let's start off with some acute toxicity assays. Here, we're just showing you um, a you know, classic oxidative stress assay using paraquat. And what we've got here is worms loaded onto the infinity chip and being exposed to three different concentrations of paraquat. So we've got three different populations, so three, you know, three chips each at three different time points. So we're looking at day one adults, day four adults, and day seven. And as you can see, obviously, as you increase the amount of paraquat, you end up seeing an acceleration in the rate of death. You know, obviously, more oxidative stress, the more lethal it is. What's really interesting, though, is that if you, as you go from day one to day seven, you actually see that day seven animals are more susceptible even to lower concentrations and die more rapidly than than day one adults. So that's an example of being able to do a stress assay on chip. What about you know, a behavioral assay? So here's a video of worms that have been starved uh, for 10 minutes in a buffer with no OP50 and no sodium. And then what's happening is we're introducing in this video, five microliters of OP50 into a port at the top right corner that's just off screen. And what you're seeing is at the beginning of this video, the animals are stochastically distributed across the entire arena because they're obviously looking for food. But as you can hopefully see in this video, in, you know, obviously this is sped up and not real time, but you can see that very quickly the animals are sensing the presence of the OP50 and are beginning to move into that top right corner. And so, you know, this is an example of actual hemotaxis behavior being observed on the system. Now, we know that the Infinity chip is not necessarily going to be the most apt chip design for everything that the community might want to do. But what we'd like to do is engage with the community to really have a conversation about the kinds of chip designs they'd like to see. And you know, we'd really encourage you to talk to us. If you have a specific need for an assay, you can obviously just ask us. If we think that's something that we can design and we think that that will benefit the community, we can at least prototype it and see how it works. 
And so at the moment, we obviously have the Infinity chip. We have a chip a version, which we're calling the Infinity Solo, which is designed to hold individual animals. And so those that will be available soon. But again, you know, as I said, if you have specific designs, please reach out to us. We obviously want to be in, you know, as involved with the community as we can be. Now, moving forward, I'd like to talk about the next bottleneck. If we're generating large amounts of video data from both lifespan assays and behavioral studies, we're going to need a solution to try and analyze these. So the question we have to ask ourselves <coughs> is, how do you actually analyze video data? So this is that chemo taxes video that I just showed you. And obviously you've got worms moving around. So then how do you actually you know, extract meaningful data from that video? So we had a solution for this. Uh, Infinity Code was our first generation of video data analysis software. And uh, Infinity Code used a simple thresholding and filtering um, algorithm to detect objects that looked like worms. Now, you know, the way that we were assessing movement using Infinity Code is we used a simple pixel displacement criteria. So basically, if a pixel was bright because a worm was present, that meant obviously a worm was there. And then we look at subsequent frames and we basically see whether those pixels remain bright or whether they go dark. If they go dark, that means the worm has moved on from that spot. And so we're really just looking at whether the worms are actively moving or not. So the way we score death in Infinity Code is if an object that's a worm hasn't moved across the entirety of the video, it's, it's labeled as being dead. If it's obviously moved away and those pixels are changing, then obviously we're saying that those animals are alive. Now, that's a very simple way of scoring death, but it's very akin to what we do on plates, which is we're just assessing whether the worms are responding to a touch and able to move. Now, obviously, if you're using any kind of algorithm, there is a need for some level of manual curation. And so Infinity Code was designed to let you correct any errors in the automated detection of worms. And the nice thing about Infinity Code is that it gave you activity-based measures based on how active those animals were during that video. So you could actually get a sense of the proportion of activity in that population per video. And then you could obviously compare it across the different ages of that chip. But we did run into problems with Infinity Code. So Infinity Code was a desktop app that we designed. And we designed it when we were really thinking about sort of you know, analyzing dozens of videos at a time. But the downside of, uh, of that is that we quickly as a company, you know, because we do internal experiments, uh, grew to the point where we now routinely execute hundreds of experiments uh, at a time. And so we have just a very large pipeline of video production. And so we realized that the threshold-based detection method that we were employing just wasn't really built for scale because the need for manual annotation just grew exponentially and really slowed everything down. You can see in this diagram, you can, you know, you've got a bad chip with a lot of air bubbles and some debris, and a lot of things end up being detected as being worms, even though they're not. And so we really had to rethink how we approached our data analysis pipeline. And so we realized that we actually had a data repository that contained over 70,000 manually created, curated objects. That includes both worms, but also more importantly, it contains non-worm objects that we want you know, to, to get our algorithms to recognize as not being worms, and that's important. And so together, those things actually end up being the perfect training set for doing machine learning-based approaches. So what I'd like to introduce you to now is our machine learning-based uh, data solution. And we're calling this NEMA Studio AI. To develop NEMA Studio AI, we actually evaluated multiple machine learning algorithms with our training data set. And then we picked the best in class to be part of the platform. So just for those of you not so familiar with machine learning, machine learning is really just you know, algorithms that are designed, designed to classify objects. So in, in this particular case, in a video here of cars moving on a freeway, you can see that these different colored boxes I represent two things. They represent the speed of the car and the type of the car that you're seeing. And so that machine learning algorithm is basically learning to classify the objects based on their speed and the type of vehicle being seen. Now we can take algorithms like that and apply it to the worm. 
And so we can actually try and get machine learning to improve the ability to detect those worms rather than just using simple threshold index mechanisms. Now we've implemented this and we're currently um, putting uh, NEMA Studio uh, through beta testing, but NEMA Studio itself will end up being in the cloud. So how does NEMA Studio actually work? So I'll take you through the beta workflow. And one thing I do want to point out is that we intend to launch NEMA Studio later in the fall and we are recruiting people to the beta. So if you have videos and you'd like to be part of this, uh, contact us and we'll be happy to you know, potentially put you on the, on the beta and let you test NEMA Studio as we build it out. So the current workflow is that you upload your videos to a NEMA Studio AI Dropbox folder. And that folder is unique to your lab. No one else gets to see those videos except us. Um, because at the moment, we're the ones who initiate the processing. In the future, we won't even have to do that step. Once NEMA Studio is fully migrated to our servers, all of the processes will actually be automatic and we won't even need to see your videos. But at the moment, we see that your videos are uploaded and then we initiate the processing. And so the algorithms are run and that generates an annotated file with the output. We then send you the output file and we send you a performance report that tells you how well each of those videos was processed because sometimes video quality will matter. And so if you know that a video wasn't great, that allows you to you know, rethink whether you need to redo that particular condition or not. Once you have the output file, what you need to do is obviously it's, it's, it's AI, but you know, AI, no AI is perfect. So there will be potentially some errors. So we give, the, the, you know, give you the ability to do that final quality control checks and obviously update any annotations that you might need to. So I'd like to take you through an example of the curation from real data. So here is our curation tool. This is currently on the desktop, but it will actually be in the cloud eventually. And so what you end up doing is that you'll upload the output file, so upload the output file into the curation app. And now you'll see your worms, and this is you know, the different frames in the video. So you'll be able to scroll through the video and see how the worms move, and you're seeing classification based on the activity levels of the animals. Now, we're going to go back to the first screen, and you can see that there are some errors. So for example, we've got two worms lumped together here, and then we've got a worm that seems to have been missed out. So we can actually delete that box around the two worms that have been lumped together, and then you know, we want to go look at that worm that hasn't been scored. Now in NEMA Studio, in the creation tool, you can actually get a preview of the activity of that animal. So you just hover over that worm and you'll be able to see whether it was moving or not. And that confirms it's a living worm. So we want to now just select it and tell the system that that is a worm. Now we've, we can also look for things that haven't been detected. So if you actually look to the bottom left corner, it looks like there's an object down here that looks like it might be a worm, but it might be rather sickly. So what we're able to do is zoom in in this area to get a better look at it. And so, yeah, that's probably a worm. And we think it's probably a worm that has died, right? And so we can, we, we can annotate that. And then we can classify that object as being a worm that is dead. So we can tell the system that you know, that worm probably is going to be moving. Now, one thing I want to point out is that obviously we're using best-in-class algorithms that are around at the moment, but we know that this is a fast-moving space. And so we intend to regularly update the algorithms at the heart of NEMA Studio so that you can always ensure that they are the most up-to-date and that, you know, that will always ensure that the annotation will get better and better and, you know, more reliable. Now, one thing that we really know the community needs, especially for those of you interested in behavioral stress assays, is you need worm tracking. And so we are building worm tracking into NEMA Studio AI. And that will obviously help those of you in the behavioral space, you know, get the types of metrics that you want, such as worm velocity, looking at track lengths, you know, obviously reversals, um, that type of behavior. So that is all being built into NEMA Studio at the moment. Okay, moving on. I'd like to talk about the final part of our agenda today, and that's screening services. So NEMA Life provides 
services to both academic and industry partners. And so for our academic uh, partners, what we're really doing is giving you hardware and software solutions to accelerate your research. Now, on the other hand, what Lima Life does for industry partners is we essentially conduct screening. So we help our partners, you know, look at whole animal data during their product development cycle. And this could look at, you know, stress assays, it could look at lifespans, it can look at a range of different uh, types of assays, including molecular profiling. So we can do metabolomics and we can obviously do transcriptomics too. And so those screening services are, you know, very popular with our industry clients. Now, obviously, because of our industry clients, we have to have internal systems for doing, you know, ultra high throughput experiments. And so we're constantly building new ways of increasing our own in-house capacity. And so we've gone from having the infinity screening system and the ways of those to having systems that are imaging, you know, four, four chips at a time to eight chips at a time. And now we're actually also using robotics to manipulate chips. And so, you know, this has allowed us to, you know, this improvement in our own internal hardware has allowed us to get up to the point where we can average about 500 chips per day. And we think very soon we'll actually be able to scale that to about a thousand chips per day. So what does that actually mean for you? Well, that increase in capacity allows us to bring down the costs of screening quite dramatically. And we think this will be very useful to academic labs. What we imagine is that if we can reduce the price down to, to what labs are typically paying, we can get very competitive on these high throughput assays and we give you a very fast turnaround time. And we think that will be useful in sort of two scenarios. One, whether when you're getting primary data for a grant application, or two, where you have, let's say in AIM-1, a need for a large screen that would just be very tedious for your lab to do on its own. So in those situations, we think our services may provide a useful alternative where we can do the work for you. So if you're interested in doing something like that, or if you're interested in, in for example, writing a grant where you know that you need to do a large screen, we could potentially be a subcontractee on that grant and do that screen for you so that you're not having to you know, develop that capability in your lab. And we think that's a useful service. Okay, so moving on, a question a lot of you are probably gonna have is pricing. So first off, I'd like to talk about the infinity chips themselves. So um, here is a table with our pricing per chip. And as you see, this is our old pricing in the first row. And the way we used to have our pricing is that it was about, worked out about $75 a chip if you were buying in increments of 10 or 20 chips. And then if you were buying in bulk, the price came down. But if you were buying around 500 chips, the price was about $45 per chip. Now, as we've grown, we're able to actually manufacture more chips and that's brought our cost down. And so the new price using sort of an a la carte model where you just buy the chips that you need, we can do 45, the pricing will start at $45 per chip if you're just buying 10, 20 or 50 chips. And then we'll go down to about $30 if you're buying 500 chips. Now we know that obviously it can be difficult for you to predict how many chips you want and there'll be periods where you just need guaranteed supply. So something that we're introducing now with an even lower price point is a subscription. So we'll be able to sell you subscriptions for chips, monthly subscriptions for chips that will run in either six, nine or 12 month aliquots. And there you'll be able to buy either 10, 20, 50 or hundred chips a month, depending on your needs. And obviously that allows us to further reduce the price point for the chips. Now, what about the infinity screening system? Well, some of you have purchased the infinity screening system before and some of you have seen our previous quotes. So um, our previous price for the infinity system was actually $33,000. And as of today, we're announcing that we're dropping the price down to $22,000 for an outright purchase of the unit. Now, we know that obviously with everything in flux around the world, we want to offer our clients the ability to have some flexibility in how they pay for the infinity system. So we're also introducing a 12 month install, in, installment plan where you can pay for the system over the course of the year. And we're gonna charge a slight premium on that, which will end up costing $23,880 over that year with, with 12 monthly installments at $19.90 a month. So what about the Phoenix? Well, the Phoenix is gonna cost $19.90, right? For an outright purchase. 
And I, I should point out that we also think those people who are interested in the Phoenix may want to potentially just bundle it with a chip subscription. So let's say you think you're going to use 20 chips per month, then we're going to charge you $625 a month for those chips. And the Phoenix, that's obviously 7,500 over the course of that year, you'll get 240 chips. And that works out to the Phoenix essentially being only $300. So we think bundles may be a good way for getting you know, the, the Phoenix into, the, into people's laps. One thing I should point out, we are not an Apple authorized reseller. So we cannot sell the iPods to you. That's something that you have to get on your own. What about NEMA Studio? So NEMA Studio is going to be priced using a software as a service model. So NEMA Studio AI will have an annual access fee of $125 per lab. That's to, regardless of how many people in your lab use NEMA Studio. It's $125 for the entire lab. That fee will include cloud storage of all those video files. And the way that this will work is we will charge a $1 per video processing fee for doing, for running NEMA Studio on that video. So you'll be able to buy essentially a video pack that will be a hundred, you know, allow a hundred units of videos to be processed for a hundred dollars. And then we'll have discounts that will kick in as you buy, you know, larger increments of packs. So let's just go through a quick summary of what we've been talking about today. We've been talking about four different topic areas. So first we started off talking about our technology for automating lifespans, and that's really the infinity screening system which is built for high throughput lifespan assays. You can do a hundred chips per day, and that's the equivalent of looking at 50 different conditions per lifespan study. Then we introduced you to our solution for behavioral studies, the Phoenix, which is a compact phenotyping tool. And that's really built for shorter term assays because obviously it's manual liquid exchange. But the nice thing about the Phoenix is you can just leave it in the incubator and image all day. And we actually think the Phoenix is gonna be a really great tool for educational outreach. Then I introduce you to NEMA Studio AI. NEMA Studio AI is video data analysis built for scale. And it comes with online storage of that, those video data, of that video data. And we're building in features that we think the community will really want, such as worm tracking. And then finally, I gave you, um, a, you know, an introduction to our screening services for academic labs. As I said, we have large testing capacity, and that means that we can bring our prices for screening down. And we think that that'll be really useful for, for, for labs that want to do either preliminary screens for data for grant applications, or potentially even you know, have us be a subcontractee, let's say an R01 application, where your part of your first aim includes a large screen. So you know, we really think we can take away a lot of the tedium from, from the early part of that work and then let you focus in on the more interesting dissection of what that, those, that data means. So that's our summary. I'd like to thank our academic partners who have been, you know, supporting our continued growth. This is just a, you know, the institutions that have so far been involved with either using the Infinity system or the chips and, or, you know, and the Phoenix. And I'd like to just play a quick video testimonial from Dr. Tom LaRocca. Tom is at Colorado State University and here are his words on why he thinks NEMA Life is a great platform for automating lifespan assays. So I first heard about the NEMA Life system at the 2017 International C. Elegans Conference. Uh, I was lucky enough to see some talks and, and go buy some posters that grad students were presenting. And I got really interested in the system because at the time I was a postdoc and I was in a lab in which we were studying neurodegeneration um, using worms as a model. But um, my background really was in research on aging and I was really interested in taking what I was learning in that lab and going to um, study aging using worms. And so I was trying to do uh, some aging experiments sort of on the side, uh, but it was found that it was really laborious and time intensive and I really didn't get much done on top of all the other things I had to be doing. So when I started my own lab, it was really tops on my list to, to get a NEMA life in our lab. Uh, in terms of what we do with it in the lab right now, we use it in mostly smaller scale experiments, so we're not screening large libraries of compounds or anything, but um, we study aging and health span, and so we're testing compounds that might increase health span, uh, both in wild type worms and mutant strains to look at mechanisms. Um, we use it fairly often. Um, 
we have sort of a translational model in the lab. So we use multiple models, mice and cell culture and even human subjects. So we're really not a worm only lab. Uh, but the great thing about the Nemo Life for us is that it's possible for us to do high quality lifespan and health span experiments kind of occasionally when we need to. So we do that several times per year. Um, and it's been really great for us because we've been able to get folks who are not super experienced with um, C. elegans work using the system and generating good data in those experiments pretty quickly. Uh, the biggest challenge we found is just managing and analyzing the data. As you can imagine, the system really outputs a lot of data, which is great. Uh, that's the case in any lifespan experiments, I think, but the NEMA life data can be mined for things like behavior and um, locomotion and other health span parameters. Um, so it's just a lot of work, uh, but again, that's the case with, with most of these kinds of experiments. And the NEMA Life team has been really good in helping us with software and other options for, for dealing with that and analyzing that data. So overall, we've been really happy with it. It's really definitely helped us in our work and made it much easier, like I said, to get newer people um, who haven't worked a lot with C. elegans, but are experienced in some of our other models really contributing on that level. Yeah, I'd like to thank Tom for that testimonial. And um, I'm just going to put up uh, as our final part, just uh, some written testimonials from some, from some of our users. So we've got people using both the Infinity Screen System or just the chips. And I'm just going to leave this up there. And I think now we'll open up the floor to the question and answer portion. Martin? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Deval. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okie dokie. So let's see the questions. We have a question about the chip reusability. Yeah. Um, sure. So we obviously recommend that you use the chips once. And the reason we do that is that we will replace a chip that debonds from you know, mechanical failure um, for free. Now, obviously, the more you use a chip, the more that you increase the chance of a failure where the, the, the PDMS that's attached to the glass will essentially come off and delaminate. Um, so there are protocols, and we have users who do reuse the chips, and we don't frown upon that. We understand that, obviously, that is something that just makes sense in academia. And we, we know there are protocols out there, um, but just be aware that if a chip fails after its initial use, we won't cover that and replace it for free. So we don't mind you reusing the chips, you know, we're, we're not going to say anything about it, but any chip that fails in its initial use will always be replaced for free. Uh, we, you know, PDMS bonding to glass has a failure rate in our hands. We find that it's about 5% of, of chips and we will always usually typically bundle extra chips when we send you chips. Um, but yeah, obviously continued reuse of those chips and exposure to bleach to get rid of worms and dissolve the carcasses will eventually lead to a mechanical failure. And so that's just something to be aware of. Yes, uh, then we have a question about um, uh, fluorescent uh, recordings and observations. Uh, can you uh, distinguish, for example, different intensity uh, GFP and m -cherry signals in the yeah, chip? Uh, you can, so <clears throat> it really depends on the optics and the imaging setup that you're using. So that, that imaging was not on the infinity screening system that was actually just using the Infinity ship. So this is just us taking it to our epifluorescent microscope. So I should point that out. The Infinity screening system itself does not have the ability to do fluorescent imaging. It's just a black and white, you know, uh, well, it's a color camera, but it's, it's not an epifluorescent uh, system. Now, the chip comes in two varieties. We either have uh, the chip bond to glass slides, which obviously are thicker. And we know that some of you don't have extra long working distance objectives, uh, and some of you do. So we prefer to, you know, for robustness, we prefer to bond the infinity chip to the, the thicker glass slides, but we also can bond to cover slip. And so for those of you who do have workflows where you're going to want to take these uh, chips and put them on your epifluorescent setup, if you don't have extra long working distance objectives, let us know, and we will make your infinity chips bonded to cover slip. And that will allow you to do fluorescence imaging with a, a more traditional fluorescence setup. Thank you. Um, then there's a question about uh, scoring uh, death. Uh, how do we do that uh, in the chips? 
Yeah, so it's again, it's, it's, it's movement based. So we are recording the position of those animals across the entire video. And so if a worm doesn't move for that 90 second video in the, that we typically use in an infinity screening system, remember we do a wash step before we actually do the recording. That wash actually acts as a stimulant. And so animals that are capable of moving will move. Um, and you know, they'll be, they'll be essentially agitated by the fact that there's new fresh buffer and fresh food that have been flown in. And so it typically, if a worm really doesn't respond to that stimulus, you know, we've actually shown in our published paper from in scientific reports from last year, that those worms truly are dead. They won't actually respond to a mechanical, mechanical touch on the chip. You can actually press them down and they won't respond. So yeah, in the video analysis, it's movement-based. Yes, uh, I just want to add uh, quickly that that um, it doesn't have to move a lot. So the criteria is basically only a few uh, pixels uh, displacement. So um, as long as the worm is actually not crawling away, but moves a tiny little bit the head or the tail, and even very severely uncoordinated animals do that, uh, then the system can score it as still live. But if it's truly a mutant that has no muscle activity whatsoever, then we won't be able to uh, record that. Uh, can the system distinguish bagged worms? Yes, actually. So in Nemo Studio, you can, you can tell if, if, if the animal died from bagging. You'll be able to see in the video. Um, you'll be able to, you know, the resolution is good enough to see uh, sort of the, the, the misshapenness of bagged worms and obviously um, the carcasses. So you, you will be able to track that across the video. And it's actually an option in the data curation tool. You can actually tag a worm as, as, as having died from matricide. Thank you. Um, there's a question about uh, the washing. So how adults and the progeny are distinguished and how is it made sure that only adults are retained in the chip? So we, the chip has a size-based filter. So adults, once you load an L4 into the main arena, they're too big to actually pass through the sieve, sieve uh, barrier. Um, and it's purely a mechanical size thing. So typically anything smaller than an L3 is gonna be flushed out, but anything bigger than an L3 is gonna be retained. And that's why we recommend daily washing if you're using a system where you're not using progeny blocking drugs so that you're always getting rid of animals before they get to the L3 stage. Um, thank you. We have a question about uh, motor deficit. Uh, what happens if a worm um, uh, is pretty uh, severely uncoordinated? Can it leave uh, the loading port area? Um, how do we use that? Yeah, so <clears throat> the nice thing about loading the worm is that you're, you're essentially using fluid flow and the worms are very flexible and the pillars are flexible too. So they're not hitting a hard object. So as you flow in, even if you have a very uncoordinated worm, you know, the, the actual fluid flow will just push the worms away and displace them. So you don't need to worry too much. You know, obviously we don't recommend that you apply a tremendous amount of pressure. That's not good for the worms. It's not good for the chip, but, but you know, typically just the actual active loading will disperse the worms across the chip. Um, yes, uh, and I just wanted to add that uh, basically most uh, unk mutants actually will be able to uh, just move away a little bit from the loading port as well. So um, if it's over hours or a couple of days, uh, they usually still do. Uh, then uh, there's a question about how the media is exchanged, uh, how efficient is the distribution and whether the worms stay in place uh, during the fluid exchange. Uh, so it really, so the nice thing about the infinity system is that it, you, you can actually calibrate and control the flow rate. Um, so really it depends on the worms size. You know, if you're worried that you've got a slightly smaller mutant and you don't want to obviously have too much fluid flow, that all of those parameters are adjustable. So you have control over, over how quickly the fluid flows in and obviously how much is being loaded in. So those are all user adjustable. And um, can you go back a little bit to the design of the chip? Uh, uh, do you want me to uh, pull up? Pull up yes, the... uh, to one of the previous slides. Yeah, so let's, let's go to this one. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to point out that the design is exactly um, 
like this to optimize uh, the wash. So basically, there's no area in the micropillar arena that uh, would uh, not experience a significant strong uh, buffer flow. So um, all the uh, progeny, the debris is washed out of the corners every part of the arena as well. And uh, we have videos, uh, I mean, you can see it in the system yourself, but uh, we have videos that show basically the worms are not moving at all when you apply uh, the wash, only the debris and the progeny flows out. Um, the pillars uh, keep them in place. Uh, next question is about uh, the NEMA Studio, uh, whether it's uh, specific to videos made uh, using the Infinity system, or uh, does it work with uh, other videos as well? So we actually think it will work with other videos. We haven't tested it. And, and again, that's why I do encourage those of you who would be interested in, in looking at how it performs and be part of the beta test to contact Martin or myself. Uh, my email um, is available. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, we'd absolutely love to, you know, the beta testing is obviously free. You don't have to pay us while we're, while we're developing the product. So if you want to just see if, if this is working for other, so, you know, other types of imaging, we'd be happy to test. Uh, yes, actually, a large part of the development went <clears throat> into uh, things like uniformity of the illumination and um, other parameters. Uh, so in, in theory, uh, it could work, uh, but uh, it would work definitely best with, uh, with our hardware that was optimized uh, for the right imaging. Um, so a question about uh, uh, whether the survival, project information, body size, stress levels are compar uh, comparable in the chip uh, to those uh, measured on agar plates? Yes, so uh, all of that information is actually in our scientific reports paper from last year. So you'll actually be able to see all the validation studies that were done um, for, 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 for chip-based lifespans using this, these pillared arrays. And we have another paper in development, um, which will you know, probably go to bioarchive later this year uh, before it goes out for peer review. And, but again, all of our in-house validation suggests that the worms are you know, similar size, similar body length width, um, have obviously similar levels of progeny production. But all of those we've already done. And I, and I showed some of that data earlier today. Yeah. I think um, we probably have time for one more question, Martin. Okay, uh, there's a question about uh, worms uh, being detected, lost, and re-detected. Uh, what happens if there's an overlap? So, it, yeah, okay. So, I mean, that can actually obviously happen. And so that's really where that manual curation is, is required. So obviously across the frames, you may have, you know, one or two animals missing. You'll be able to see the exact numbers in a frame. Now we don't, advocate that you, you manually annotate every single frame of your video. Um, typically, the way the NEMA Studio Beta is working is that we'll just annotate, depending on the length of your video, a subset of frames. And we're, we're looking for just consistency in the numbers of animals that we're seeing. You'll get um, you know, the counts. And so you'll be able to see what you're seeing in each of those frames. And then you can just go to that frame and see, OK, did it miss a worm? Do I need to add a worm in or do I, you know, you know, and then you'll be able to look across the video at the annotated frames and say, okay, this is consistent and therefore I'm good with this. If you're seeing obviously inconsistency, that's something that in the beta you should be letting us know because obviously that means we need to tweak parameters in the studio. Uh, do we have to stop now or? I think, I think we're at time. So yeah, I, I... we have a few more questions and uh, I think there's a poster session today yes, as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, so Martin and I will be at the poster session this afternoon. Um, and so yeah, those of you whose questions we couldn't get to, I'm really, mm -hmm. we do apologize, but obviously stop by and we'll be able to talk to you in person and give you the answers to your questions. And just one more thing, uh, you can see a QR code in the corner of the slides. Uh, if uh, you would like to request a couple of uh, free chips, then uh, you can either just read that uh, with your phone. It's also on our website um, in the International World Meeting 2021 um, tab and um, or just uh, shoot us an email at uh, info uh, at uh, nemalifeinc.com 
and uh, we will ship you a couple free examples so you can test it uh, yourself. Okay, so I'd just like to end by thanking you all for, for attending this session. I hope it was informative and uh, yeah, any more questions, please come and find us at the poster session. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Goodbye.